cinema owes a debt to Mario Bava. He isn't as well known as Wes Craven or Dario Argento or John Carpenter, but Mario Bava is one of the most influential film directors to ever work in the horror field. Bava was born in San Remo, Italy in 1914. Like many young aspiring painters, he was unable to make a living. Luckily, he found another passion, the art of cinematography. He was, as you can tell, very good at it. In the 1950s and 60s, many Italian films were shot without sound, and the dialogue was instead recorded during the post-production process. This allowed filmmakers to easily export their works to other nations, where they could be dubbed into the local language. Naturally, there were several side effects to this process. For instance, the dubbing sometimes seems off and awkward. I'll admit that the sight of those runaway horses had me worried about you. Or the plot might appear a bit dreamlike. Or the films had to rely primarily on visual storytelling and atmosphere instead of dialogue. This served Mario Bava well, as he transitioned from cinematographer to director. So let's look at some reasons why Mario Bava is considered a pioneer of the golden age of Italian horror. To set the stage, let's take a brief speed run through Italian cinema history. The silent era was democratic. Films didn't rely on spoken language, and a motion picture could be exported to any and all foreign language nations. It was only a matter of changing the text and splicing in the new title cards. The silent Italian film industry wasn't as big or influential as the German or American industry, but it did make an impact. This film, Cabiria, from 1914, was an early epic that helped push the film industry into grander, more visually oriented film spectacles. Italy was also home to one of the earliest avant-garde film movements, Italian Futurism. Futurism as an art movement had its origins in Italy, and it only made sense for Italian filmmakers to follow the lead of Italy's painters. The Italian Futurist film movement has been said to have inspired German Expressionist cinema, which itself was key in influencing the language of horror cinema. However, it is hard to know for sure how much of an influence the Italian Futurist movement was. Of the six Italian Futurist films produced, only half of a single one survives today, and as you can see, the print isn't in good shape. Italy's first horror film, The Monster of Frankenstein from 1920, didn't have much more luck. The film was met with heavy censorship upon release. It is today lost, with only a still and a few lobby cards surviving. Horror cinema and bold, expressive stylism wasn't welcomed in Italy for the next few decades. The reason was this guy, Il Duce, Benito Mussolini. The Italian fascist government came to power in 1922 and stayed in power until 1943 when Italy was invaded by Allied forces. Mussolini was imprisoned, but was later rescued by German special forces. He didn't have many places to go, and was ultimately captured and killed by Italian communists in 1945. Mussolini, like any dictator, restricted free speech and expression. Most of the films produced under his rule were easy-going domestic comedies, known as Telefoni Bianchi, white telephone films. White telephones were status symbols, something few could afford, but many aspired to own. Basically, these films were light, wish-fulfillment fantasies. Horror cinema is the cinema of fear, and the exploration of reasons behind fear. That makes the entire genre bothersome to dictators, because filmmakers will inevitably reflect the real monsters through their allegorical creations. Following World War II, the Italian film industry began to pull itself up by the bootstraps. Italian neorealism perfectly reflected the dire social conditions of the country, and directors such as Roberto Rossellini, Vittorio De Sica, and Federico Fellini created a new Italian cinematic language. 
Neorealism was a high-minded form of cinema, and while the films are powerful and captivating, they are also not easily translatable to international mainstream audiences. Director Ricardo Freda wanted to change that. He set out to produce a commercial and compelling horror film, something not done in Italy since The Monster of Frankenstein. E Vampiri was a moody, haunted film. It was also a commercial flop, and it failed to reignite Italian horror. Freda wrote it off as a miscalculation, thinking Italian horror might not be commercially viable after all. His cinematographer, Mario Bava, would soon prove him wrong. The production of Ivan Piri was troubled, and Freda left the project before it finished shooting. It was up to Mario Bava to complete the film. While uncredited, Mario Bava here got his first taste of directing. After the film was released and deemed a failure, not much happened to Italian horror for a couple of years. Instead, the Italian peplum film became the country's main export, a heritage from early Italian epics like Cabiria. These swords and sandal adventures were built on the surprising global success of Hercules. Imitations immediately followed. Mario Bava worked on a few such films, and he even finished a couple when their directors left the production early. Meanwhile, in England, Hammer Films and director Terence Fisher succeeded where Ricardo Freda had failed. Gothic and graphically violent horror films were suddenly a booming business. The Italians wanted another crack at the genre, taking their cues from international cinema instead of their own cinema history. In 1960, Mario Bava was offered a chance to direct, not only because he had a compelling cinematic point of view, but also as a reward for having saved several troubled productions, co-directing them without credit. Bava chose to make The Mask of Satan, released in the US as Black Sunday. The story drew on Russian lore, specifically the story Viji by Nikolai Gogol. Though, narratively and stylistically, the film had as much in common with British hammer horror as it did with Russian mythology. Black Sunday was, for its time, an extremely violent film, testing the boundaries of censorship, even more so than the British did. <laughs> Distributor American International Pictures bought the US rights to Black Sunday. They paid more for those rights than it had cost to actually make the film. This immediately told Italian producers that there was a great international market for horror content. Even though American censorship and the Hays Code was in its early death throes, the American version of Black Sunday was cut by three minutes before being released in the US. The distributors removed some of the most graphic violence, adding a new musical score and deleted all references to incest. It didn't matter. Even muted, the film's power bleeds through the screen. Mario Bava's career as a director had begun. Over the next 20 years, he would make several films, most of them in the horror genre. Some of them were commercially successful, and many of them were not. However, they left a huge mark on Italian and international film directors, due to Mario Bava's spellbinding approach to his material. If I were to go through all of these films and cite all the influences taken and given, we'd have a thousand-page tome of material to cover. So instead, I'll choose a small selection of his films to explore. But fear not, if you were hoping for a more in-depth 1,000-page-plus opus about Mario Bava, you're in luck, because Tim Lucas wrote one called Mario Bava, All the Colors of the Dark. It is probably one of the most comprehensive books ever written about a single director. But which Mario Bava films should I focus on? Should I take a look at Planet of the Vampires, which shares a thematic link with Alien and other later space-set horror films? But so do earlier science fiction films as well. Mario Bava wasn't so much paving the way here than he was following an already trailblazed path. We could also take a look at The Whip and the Body a ghost story with sadomasochistic themes. The film spearheaded a path into the violent exploitation films of the 1970s. Or we could study Kill Baby Kill, which Martin Scorsese cites as Bava's most accomplished film. There are many valuable images and motifs in this movie, and they are said to have influenced Japanese horror cinema. I agree with Scorsese, this is probably Bava's best film. And if you haven't seen any of his works, start with this one. 
but in many ways it is more like a continuation of the themes he explored in Black Sunday. Despite this possibly being Bava's best film, it isn't his most influential one, and that says something, considering several later filmmakers in Japan and the rest of the world were clearly inspired by it. Perhaps then I should look at Lisa and the Devil, which likely was Bava's most personal film. It is a haunting and lyrical movie, one that doesn't tell a story with a plot, but rather tells a story with a sense of atmosphere. But Lisa and the Devil was recut against Mario Bava's wishes. <coughs> Worse, new footage was shot and added featuring a priest performing an exorcism. This cut was given a new title, House of Exorcism, in order to cash in on the recent success of The Exorcist, but it had otherwise absolutely nothing to do with Bava's original version. The original cut of Lisa and the Devil was for a time hard to find in the US, and it doesn't seem to be a particularly influential piece in Mario Bava's body of work. All of these films are, in my opinion, worth analyzing, but the three Baba films I think are the most influential are the ones that created entire subgenres of their own. They are A Bay of Blood, and the duo The Girl Who Knew Too Much and Blood and Black Lace. The Girl Who Knew Too Much was released in early 1963. It was a crime thriller about a young woman who witnesses a killing, but, of course, nobody believes her. The title is a clear play on Alfred Hitchcock's thriller, The Man Who Knew Too Much, from 1956, a remake of Hitchcock's own 1934 film. But unlike the stylish, classy 1956 film with James Stewart and Doris Day, Mario Bava's film was gritty, lurid, and raw. It combined the Hitchcock touch with the style of the German creamy subgenre. The creamy films were violent police procedurals, often based on the literature of author Edgar Wallace. Bava likely adopted the creamy style because he felt the plot of the girl who knew too much was silly and nonsensical. His solution was to dress it up and make it more sellable by combining traditional thriller elements with dark eroticism and horror-styled cinematic techniques. The end result was a film that didn't quite work, but still, the director was onto something. One year later, Mario Bava further explored the cinematic conventions he'd established in The Girl Who Knew Too Much. This time, he was making another sensual horror thriller about murder. He set the story in an Italian fashion house, where models are stalked and killed. The film was called Blood and Black Lace, and it added an important new element to the formula. Color. The gaudy and bold use of color heightened the film's graphic nature. The murders were staged with an operatic, overblown flair, and the camera prowled like a lurking, predatory animal. Blood and Black Lace doesn't spend much time on character development, unlike Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho or Michael Powell's Peeping Tom, which were films that truly pioneered the horror-thriller hybrid genre. Instead, Bava focused on the murders. This sensationalism, the effective camera work, and the color, they all lay the groundwork for a brand new subgenre, the Italian giallo. Giallo means yellow, and the genre is a mix of slasher film and murder mystery. In fact, in Italy at the time, cheap paperback mystery novels were traditionally published with yellow covers, hence the term giallo. The giallo genre usually deals with eroticism, insanity, and paranoia, all themes seen in the two Mario Bava films that first established the style cinematically. The giallo genre also influenced filmmakers outside of Italy. Alfred Hitchcock, whose films clearly inspired Bava in the first place, later made the thriller Frenzy. Frenzy is more violent, lurid, and sexually perverse than previous Hitchcock films. Whether or not Hitchcock was directly influenced by Bava and other giallo filmmakers, I cannot say for sure. But the giallo genre had built upon the groundwork Hitchcock laid, and in doing that, they forced the horror thriller genre into darker, more sexually dangerous territory. This opened new doors to more explicit films, and Hitchcock was more than happy to walk through them when he made Frenzy. <laughs> Remember when I said the giallo was a combination of slasher film and murder mystery? 
Well, keep in mind that the term slasher film didn't exist in the 1960s, at least not in its modern context. The slasher genre developed during the 1970s, truly taking off with genre-defining works such as Halloween and Friday the 13th. <laughs> Fun fact, Mario Bava got there first. Through the late 1960s, many of Bava's films were underperforming, and Bava tried to capture the attention of an audience that were suddenly freed from the shackles of the now dead Hayes Code. With the old censorship system gone, and a new, more lenient one in place, filmmakers had more options. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, thrillers and horror films pushed the boundaries of violence. Earlier Bava efforts like Black Sunday had paved the way, allowing filmmakers to explore violent graphic stories. Mario Bava needed to stay relevant and edgy, but he was usually without the same financial resources as his international colleagues. Bava continued to explore murderers as horror genre monsters during this period. These films, as well as his two earlier giallo efforts, led him to make A Bay of Blood. <laughs> Blood was the most violent and brutal film of his career. Bava went beyond murder mystery, spending more time on the killings and less on the mystery part than he had in The Girl Who Knew Too Much. This created something new. The result was a proto-slasher film. A Bay of Blood was picked up for US distribution and released under the title Carnage. It was not successful. The distributors released it again under a new title, Twitch of the Death Nerve pretending it was a different film. The scheme worked, and the film played for years at Grindhouse theaters. Young filmmakers like Joe Dante were exposed to it gradually over time, and A Bay of Blood's cinematic DNA began to spread. This happened slowly at first, but once the genre convention of the slasher had been firmly established, it was clear that A Bay of Blood had left a wake in which films like Halloween and Friday the 13th and all their many imitators could thrive. Bava was at the center of the golden age of Italian horror, a period of renewed expression and freedom after years of fascist suppression. Today, some of Bava's movies can appear a bit dated when compared to more recent horror films, yet many of the filmmakers behind those more recent films looked to Mario Bava as an inspiration and genre innovator. Among them, you can count Joe Dante, and Dario Argento, and Guillermo del Toro. Mario Bava painted with celluloid, capturing new, colorful, dark worlds in spite of budgetary limitations. And as he explored these new frontiers of cinema, he created stories filled with grace, style, and lurid beauty. This dark outlook gave horror filmmakers new avenues to explore, and new subgenres to delve into. All thanks to Mario Bava, the genre maker. My name is Wolfcraft. This is History of Horror. If you enjoyed this episode, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Join me next time for I See You, Voyeurism in Horror Cinema. I am also an author. My science fiction novel God of Desolation is available on Amazon and my upcoming mystery novel, Richly Drawn, will soon be available on Inkshares.com. Thanks aplenty. <laughs>